Welcome. I'm here today with His Excellency Mohammed al Assess, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Your Excellency, for being here and taking the time for this interview. Uh, this will help the King's Academy community and those participants from beyond our community to learn and grow from this moment. The COVID, please. Go ahead. Well, the no, COVID I, just, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for hosting me today. Um, uh, it's such a pleasure, King's Academy and the partners. Um, you know, I, I have the utmost respect for your mission and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you kindly. And knowing that you are uh, from the education space uh, as a former professor, we're grateful for your uh, engagement with this educational community as well. The COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, has caused considerable disruption to virtually every industry and the financial ramifications of that have been significant. While the digital economy has enabled some industries to continue and thrive, the self-isolation happening around the world has effectively shuttered many other industries and businesses with major repercussions, of course, for different sectors and finances in particular. So Your Excellency, just to begin, especially for our student audience, I wonder if you would first start by sharing what is the role of the Minister of Finance in a context like this? Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, so the Ministry of Finance, uh, uh, it has a very broad mission to manage the fiscal affairs of the country, meaning we are in charge of managing the revenue collection uh, that accrues to the government and the expenditure that the government conducts. Uh, so basically all the money that comes in and all the money that come, goes out. Now, at a time of such crisis, uh, uh, this becomes really a, a, a very complex uh, affair to manage, mainly because of the uncertainty that surrounds the, that surrounds the situation. So there are real challenges uh, that we are facing as businesses and economies are not functioning because we imposed a curfew. Um, so the revenues that are accruing to the government are facing uh, a drop and the expenditures that we have to conduct have increased because now we have uh, uh, a heightened healthcare expenditure, safety nets, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That is on its own a massive challenge. Mm -hmm. However, what I think is most challenging to me is the uncertainty that uh, surrounds this issue. Meaning in economics and finance, we have developed a lot of uh, un good understanding and tools to deal with risk. I can hedge against risk. I can uh, build different simulations or models to teach me what's the best way to deal with the risk I'm facing. Uncertainty is very different element. Uncertainty is basically anything can happen at any different probability. And these probabilities and outcomes are unknown to us. So how do you plan forward for a whole economy not knowing what will the trajectory look like because this thing is dynamically, dynamically uh, uh, developing uh, uh, every day. So as a leader and decision maker in a moment like this, when there is so much uncertainty as opposed to risk, which you can plan for, what are the guiding principles or values that shape your thinking or govern your thinking in a moment like this? <clears throat> uh, terrific question really, Peter. Um, um, given that there is no manual for what we're going through, this is new, we're in uncharted waters. Uh, this shock is a severe structural shock on the demand side of the economy and on the supply side of the economy. We have no examples to compare to and say, aha, this is what we expect to happen. Therefore, let's prepare for that scenario. In light of this lack of information, in light of this uncertainty, it becomes very hard to start making decisions knowing very well that the state of the world you're building your decision on might be wrong to start with. Um, so when it comes to leadership at times of like this, you have to accept the fact that you don't have full information, yet you cannot delay making decisions. You have to continuously be ahead of the curve in responding to this crisis. If you wait till you have more information, it would be already too late for your response. So you have to accept the, the very uncomfortable position that you don't have sufficient information yet you have to make a decision and that decision might be wrong. And you have to accept the fact that 
you have to acknowledge that you were wrong and therefore come back and correct it. And in order to complete the circle, you have to create a very solid feedback loop. You make the decision on timely matters, you go and gather evidence to whether you actually were right or wrong, and you have to have the humility to acknowledge that you were wrong, and you have to have the courage to actually change your decision on the go and admit that and keep pushing the ball forward. So I hear in that you, you, the, the guiding principles are a willingness to make mistakes, a willingness to take risks, but an openness to learning and a responsiveness to the evidence that you, that you gather back, the feedback that you receive from that process. I think that's key. There is one more issue, if I may add to the above. Mm -hmm. At times of crises, uh, 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 the population is worried. They're concerned. They're looking up to a leader, the leader of the country, in the case of Jordan the King. He bestows confidence, uh, his majesty, on, 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 on everybody, and that reassures us to keep going forward. But I, as a, as a, as a mini leader within my own domain, mm -hmm. I have to project that confidence. So even though I myself might have a lot of questions, uncertainties, uh, hesitations, when I go forward and project my decisions, the population have to trust that the leadership will take them on a safe path. So you have to project confidence, even though the circumstances surrounding you may not provide you with that confidence. So let's come back to some of what you said about gathering that feedback. Uh, what, is the, what are the contextual factors or, or forces or, or pieces of evidence or uh, elements of the landscape around you that you are listening to and responding to uh, most, uh, most that you see as most salient or that you're listening to and responding to the most? Um, given that, as I said, we're in uncharted waters and there is no manual for this, and given that by the time you get the data feedback, it probably would be too late uh, mm -hmm. for you to adjust. So what you want is real-time feedback. Mm -hmm. And for that, you seek two sources. The first is quantitative, the, third, the second is qualitative. Mm -hmm. On the quantitative, I try to look for real-time measures that can proxy the reality. For example, it, uh, it, there is a good lag of time to have data on economic measures such as GDP or different economic activity. That takes a while, so I cannot rely on it. But for example, um, I was talking this morning to uh, Her Excellency, the Minister uh, for Energy and Mineral Resources, and I asked her to supply me with daily consumption of different uh, fuel uh, categories that will help me because we get that on daily basis. The frequency of feedback is high. Therefore, it can start proxy to me where different parts of the economy are picking up activity. Mm -hmm. For example, if a certain fuel type that's used by a certain industry is now in increasing demand, I know that there is you know, a light you know, picking up there and they start directing different policies to help them get back on their feet. If another category is suffering, that's a red alarm that I'm going to face trouble in that direction and I start predicting what policies do I need to anticipate to, to, to take care of that. So the first one is quantitative proxies. The second one is qualitative and I've been using it, frankly, much more. And mm -hmm. that is basically the wisdom of the crowds. I seek out feedback and conversations with business leaders, with representatives of the society, as much and as often as I can. Uh, uh, we in Jordan have a different group of business leaders, uh, uh, and I make sure that I interact with them frequently. Uh, I hear their feedback. I start by asking them very sincerely to give me negative as well as positive feedback and to evaluate the measures that we've done in the past few days or week. And that really is a very good source of information. The wisdom of the crowds is very important at times of uncertainty. Mm. Mm. I hear that. Listen, I hear the quantitative and qualitative feedback. And you said specifically with regards to quantitative feedback, the data that you're actively seeking often comes later than you need to use it. So you look for quantitative proxies, signals in the noise to help you understand what is going on. I see. Uh, fascinating. That's great. As you, as you look then back to the previous few months, 
in, in reading the signals that have come back to you, have there been specific turning points or moments where you've said, ah, this is a time where I need to make this significant decision? So probably one of the hardest decisions the government had to make was to impose the curfew. Mm -hmm. um, a government should usually be taking decisions that promote economic activity uh, to achieve the well-being for the citizens. To actually take a decision to halt or economic activity uh, mm -hmm. for the well-being of the people is a very tough decision. When do you impose it? Uh, one thing we learned by tracking the experience of other countries was that the false negatives are safer than the false positives. That mm -hmm. is, if we moved ahead of the curve and shut down the economy a little bit earlier than we had to, meaning before we had sufficient cases to warrant that, the damage from that is less than the damage from waiting till you have cases, rapid domestic transmission, and then you impose your measures, but it's already too late. Mm. So we decided to move ahead of the curve. And that's a bold decision because you're basically effectively hurting people's livelihoods by telling them stay at home. Mm. But what you're hoping is by moving ahead of the curve, you are able to control the domestic transmission of the disease fast enough, which allows you to reopen way earlier than otherwise. Mm. That was probably one of the most debated decisions we've taken at the cabinet. And in retrospect, we are fortunate that we've taken that decision early on because we in Jordan have been able really to flatten the curve and the numbers of infections have been on a steady drop. And we are hoping that if this continues, we can slowly open up the economy gradually within Jordan while closing the entry to Jordan under controlled terms so that we prevent virus infections from coming from abroad. We would then regain a good portion of our economy, not full of course, because the whole world is not uh, functioning on 100%, but you would have minimized the period of no activity, which is highly, highly damaging. Mm. Your Excellency, that is, that's fascinating. Um, my experience and the conversations that I have, there is extraordinary gratitude to the country and to the leaders of the country for making those decisions because of the way that it has shielded the country from the worst of this virus. While it might have been difficult at the time, and I know it was a bit of a shock to the system when it came, it is something that through hindsight, I think everyone has seen has been to the ultimate benefit of the country. Perhaps as one last question then, uh, as we think about our audience, uh, made up primarily of our students here, what counsel would you give to young leaders during this time as they think about steps that they can take now and in the future to be uh, a part of the solution for, for their communities, for their families, and for their countries? Um, number one, uh, don't shy from taking new experiences. Um, uh, don't shy from having to uh, uh, immerse yourself in something that is not familiar to you or not comfortable or you're in foreign turf for that sake. Um, the more you experience, the better you get at developing the skills you need to face unexpected circumstances. Number two, humility. Uh, nobody gets it right 100%. And if you don't want to make mistakes, you will never be able to make a decision. Uh, so accept the fact that 100% is actually a failing grade sometimes. Because if you want to achieve 100%, you are not going to be able to move under times of uncertainty, which is when you need leadership more than anything. Three, accept the fact that you cannot do it alone. The world is very, very complex. And you have to rely internally on your own team. And therefore, you better nurture leadership within your own organization and team. Because at times of crisis, you're going to need everybody to step, up, to step up and play the role. And then you need yourself to be a good team member within the outside organization. 
because we feed on each other. If we didn't get the health situation right, the economy suffering would be prolonged. If we didn't get the economy uh, situation right, the social aspects of this situation will be really challenging and hard for us to maintain. And if we don't get all of the above right, the security of the country is at risk. So you have to accept the fact that this is not a time to be a single one person show. Being a single person hero is actually a failure. You need to be a team player and you need to display humility in making these decisions. These, I think, are three good uh, 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 qualities, if I may, that you need to possess to move forward. And therefore, they should reflect on your experiences uh, uh, at, at a very safe, safe stage that you are in. Mistakes at the level that my audience are in um, are important, but fortunately, hopefully, they're not life or death decisions for a nation. Mm -hmm. This is the time to actually subject yourself to new risks and accept mistakes and accept failures, embrace failures. Mm -hmm. Your Excellency, thank you. Thank you for your time today in this busy moment in our, in our country and in our world's history. Uh, we're grateful for your efforts on behalf uh, of everyone. Um, and for our students and participants, I know that there are valuable lessons in leadership that you've just shared right there. Thank you again. Sir, so um, my absolute best wishes to everybody hearing me now for a safe recovery out of this current situation. It is at times of this, uh, such as this, that we appreciate the simple things in life. And, and, and I believe we will all, if we do what it takes to get out of this, we will all get out of it stronger, but also happier because we will appreciate things that we did not appreciate before. Thank you, sir. Thank you.